Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining our Croatan conversation, Investing in Climate Justice. There's an opportunity to invest in a just transition toward a sustainable future and a clean energy economy that promotes community resilience. In this conversation today, you're going to hear from environmental justice leaders and investors about how climate solution investments can have a social impact multiplier effect and how important it is for advances toward a clean energy economy not to leave frontline communities behind. This conversation is part of a larger series bringing leaders working on the front lines of finance, social change, and ecological resilience into deep dialogue to address some of the world's toughest social and environmental challenges. The Croton Conversation Series is a project of Croton Institute, an independent nonprofit research and action institute whose mission is to build social equity and ecological resilience by leveraging finance to create pathways to a just economy. Before we get started, we have a few housekeeping items. This conversation is being recorded and will become available on our website and YouTube pages. If you are joining us by Zoom, please use the Q&A box to ask questions at any time. Um, if you're watching on YouTube, you can post your questions in the comment box and we will do our best to answer as many of the questions as we can at the end of the uh, conversation. Next slide. Uh, just a quick note that we're going, we may be talking about investments and it is a regulated industry. So we're here to educate, not solicit. If you hear about a product, please do your own dil due diligence. This is not investment advice. Next slide. Uh, we'd like to thank the supporters of Croton Conversations, um, including Leaf Fund and Erickson Advisors. I um, also want to thank the individual supporters who have uh, supported this work and this programming through individual donations. If you're interested in learning more about how your firm um, or you can support a, the, the conversation series or a specific conversation, we'll provide that information at the end. So climate justice and investing in climate justice is more, more than just about climate action. The effects of climate change often have disproportionate effects on historically marginalized or underserved communities. Climate justice means building local resilience to climate impacts and addressing the role of society in the range of harms that intersects with the climate crisis, both locally and globally. Climate impacts and even the climate solutions that we choose to invest in uh, can exacerbate social equities. This movement is related to the environmental justice movement, which is the struggle to improve and maintain clean and healthy environment, especially for those who have traditionally lived, worked, and played closest to the sources of pollution or of environmental harm. Um, there's an interesting connection to uh, the place where we're based, which is in North Carolina, Croton Institute is based there, although we're all over the country um, and even internationally based. Uh, but Many point to the environmental justice movement being born in Warren County, North Carolina in 1982, when the state decided that this poor, rural, and overwhelmingly black county was the perfect home for truckloads of soil laced with toxic PCBs. And while the state dismissed the community's concerns um, about PCBs leaching into their drinking water, the frustrated residents and their allies lied down the, in the roads of, into the landfill to stop the trucks. and. Uh, after six weeks of marches and nonviolent street protests um, with more than 500 people arrested, uh, unfortunately they did not win, but it was the first time that communities of color had organized to oppose environmental, I'm sorry, they, it was not the first time that communities of color had organized to oppose environmental threats. Um, however, the Warren County protests were the first time that environmental protest by people of color had gotten this kind of widespread national attention. Next slide. Uh, since our founding, we've worked explicitly on issues of just transition and climate justice with groups like Divest Invest Philanthropy and in partnership with groups like Mountain Association, formerly MESED, um, as well as low resource communities across the country. We work on just transition from a variety of perspectives, whether it has to do with frontline coal communities in central Appalachia or with low resource agricultural communities like in Eastern North Carolina, um, where we do work in, in Warren County uh, as well. Next slide. The Clean Portfolio Project is Croton Institute's program area where we're developing total portfolio approaches to fossil free investing and in integrated climate solutions. 
Our goal is to show investors that are working in various asset classes um, how they can make investments and generate positive impacts on the communities on communities and the climate. Using our total portfolio activation model, uh, we we demonstrate how you can have positive or negative effects impacts on social and environmental issues. Um, next slide. Uh, the first uh, clean portfolio was the Divest Invest Clean 15 portfolio. And it, it identified 15 strategies across these five asset classes that are commonly found in the portfolios of institutional investors like philanthropic foundations and faith-based investors on a range of themes, climate solution themes. Um, so public equity, publicly focused companies trying to reduce their climate footprint, for example, or fixed income, which includes bonds and green bonds, uh, private debt, like community development loan funds and other private lending vehicles uh, like Sunwealth could describe coming up, um, and private equity and venture capital investments that may focus on clean tech and investing in private innovative companies, as well as real assets uh, such as farmland, timberland, and commercial real estate like green buildings. The project's now aiming to address the investment needs of um, the uh, institutional investors, but also retail and individual investors as we move into our next phase and to include more asset classes such as cash, hedge funds, and infrastructure. Next. In the first portfolio, we identified these as 10 climate solution themes from clean technology and renewable energy uh, to sustainable food and agriculture and sustainable forestry, as well as community development. And again, one thing that is integral to our work is integrating a, a climate justice perspective when we're thinking about these things. Um, thank you. So I'm very excited to be moderating this excellent group of climate justice activists and investors and practitioners in the um, in this space. Uh, William Barber III, who is coming to us uh, from the Rural Beacon Initiative and is also Special Projects Director at Climate Reality Project, has been working on, both on the ground and globally in the environmental justice movement. Vanda Brunsting is working with Harvard's Initiative for Responsible Investment on Just Transition Programming, um, also is a fiduciary of the Unitarian Universalist Church and has worked at, uh, with the labor movement as well at um, SEIU Capital Stewardship. Omar Blayton, who is the Chief Financial Officer at Sunwell, a clean energy investment firm with a social equity uh, built into their mandate. And Reverend Mariama White Hammond, the founder of the New Roots AME Church in Dorchester uh, in the city of Boston, uh, an environmental, a longtime environmental justice advocate who has recently taken a role as the Chief of Environment, Energy, and Open Spaces for the city of Boston. So welcome to all of you. Um, I will <laughs> I will ask you to go around and give a, a bigger introduction of yourself. Uh, and tell us, you know, why is climate justice important to you and what perspective are you bringing to this conversation on the role of investing in climate solutions to bring social environmental justice. So I will start with William Barber. Thank you so much, Christy, and thank you to everyone for joining us for the conversation today. Um, as was already mentioned, I am the founder and president of the Rural Beacon Initiative, uh, a startup LLC that seeks to um, look at the intersection of solutions in frontline communities at the intersection of sustainable ag, distributed energy and affordable housing. Um, I also do work with the North Carolina Poor People's Campaign as the Ecological Justice Co-Chair. Uh, and then of course work with Climate Reality as the Strategic Partnerships Manager, where we work to really build out partnerships with local seed climate justice and environmental justice organizations um, on the ground as we understand the uh, scale of this climate crisis. Um, in my work, um, two things, you know, I, I think about that are unique for my understanding of the climate crisis is one, when we talk about the significance of the Southeast, the Southeastern United States, right? You know, we do an interesting exercise where we take an overlay of the nation and we show that when you look at the areas that have the greatest concentration of communities that face per persistent poverty, persistent generational poverty, you have the greatest concentrations of communities of color, African-Americans per capita. And then you have an overlay of where the greatest frequency of billion dollar 
uh, weather disasters happen informed by the climate crisis, you see these hot spots that pop up right in the Southeast. Um, and not only do they pop up across the Southeastern United States, they pop up in an area that has traditionally been known as the Black Belt, but also as the Stroke Belt. And we do that as a visual exercise to, to really hammer home the understanding that when we talk about the climate crisis, how serious of a multiplier it is on deep seated social inequities, all of the forms of oppression that we have really perfected as a society over the number of years. So when we talk about the connection to systemic racism, how communities that have for generations been on the front line uh, of our dependence on fossil fuel infrastructure and have had their health, their wealth and their livelihoods disrupted, but then turn around and are now on the front lines of a very present climate crisis. We'd look at that when we talk about the fact that communities who are suffering from persistent poverty, you know, right now in America, there are 140 million people, Americans, who are uh, either poor or one life emergency away from being poor. And when you think about the effects of an unaddressed climate crisis, how it threatens to push another 100 million people worldwide into deep seated poverty, how these intersections are there. So we understand that the climate crisis uh, a massive issue in of itself serves as a multiplier on those deeply seated uh, social inequities. And so we have to understand it as such, right? That's a part of climate justice. Um, and then two, you know, another lens that we bring is as a son of the South, with that being the reality and with there being a history, not only in terms of the environmental justice movement, but really with more, most major American social justice movements, the Southeast being a crucible of what those engagements look like there's a real opportunity for leadership in this space coming from the Southeast, um, you know, to show what does it look like to take these terms of equity, of environmental justice, of climate justice, and move them from abstract concepts to actually operationalizing them. We're putting resources, we're putting expertise in the ground and seeing physical uh, 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 benefits, you know, for communities. So. Great, thank you. Um, we'll turn to Vanda. Great, thanks Christy and the Croatian Institute and everyone for being here. Um, and I, I guess for me, um, how I come to climate justice and the just transition really for both um, starts when I was growing up in Michigan um, and watching the closure of factories, uh, the auto parts plants really um, moving to the South pursuing lower wages and leaving my family and community with, if they were lucky, unemployment checks. Um, there was no, there was a transition, but there was no just transition there. And then I worked for many years at the Service Employees International Union, as you mentioned, and I, that included work with our members' pension funds. And I grew, I was excited by, but also frustrated by all of the, the great work that the pension funds were doing around climate. Um, because, you know, they were looking, pushing for more disclosure, we still are, um, doing a lot of engagement, um, finding ways to invest, but really uh, the workers and um, communities impacted were not part of those discussions. And so now what we're trying to do at um, the Initiative for Responsible Investment on the Just Transition Project is really to, to marry the two. You know, how do we how do we bring all the work on climate that investors are engaged on um, with you know, issues of environmental justice in the workforce and how do we bring them together? And so what we've done is we've provided a framework where investors can start um, really looking at what their role is and um, what they can do. So I just wanted to um, also give a little history, take a step back on the just transition. Um, the term itself, because I think it's you know um, complicated, means a lot of things to many people. So what it means to me, I guess, is is, is um, starting with history of it. And that is um, in the eighties, it became a term um, really out of an incident in New Jersey where there was a, um, the closure of a, a chemical plant and the workers demanded a just transition. Um, but it's become a more encompassing term um, and the, the global trade union movement and the international community um, now uh, the ITC defines it as smoothing the shift towards a more sustainable society and providing hope for the capacity of a green economy to sustain decent jobs and livelihoods for all. So labor brought that term, the just transition into the Paris Agreement and into the preamble, which talks about the imperative of a just transition. 
And I also just wanted to, in addition to that, bring in the Climate Justice Alliance definition, because um, in the US, and I think more broadly, um, it's now been picked up. Um, and I think their definition um, resonates really well. So that is, um, the just transition is a, a set of principles, processes, and practices that build economic and political power to shift from an extractive economy to a regenerative economy. So for me, um, I think we're, you know, that building that that requires building collective power um, on the ground um, in communities um, with workers um, and with investors. And then how do we do that? Um, how do we do that collaboratively? So our goal um, in starting this project on the just transition was really to find a, a role for investors. That's kind of our niche area. So we started in 2018 and then in 2019, um, collaborating with the Principles for Responsible Investment, put out a statement um, where we had um, 161 investors with 10 trillion in assets under management commit to um, you know, learning and engaging around the just transition. So we've gotten people's attention um, and now what do we do with it? And so we're starting to look at some um, some ways we can um, sort of take that interest and put it into operation, but I'll save that for um, for later in our conversation. Great, thank you. Uh, let's turn to Omar. Thanks, Christy. Um, so Sunwell's you know main uh, goal is to democratize the benefits as well as investment in kind of solar energy across different populations and uh, communities. And so because of that, you know, it, climate justice is kind of central to what we need to do. Um, the way we kind of we democratize is by, you know, highlighting, recognizing and highlighting uh, value in communities that are traditionally overlooked by um, bigger financial institutions. And so you know, we kind of see, you know, that recognition of value as essential to, um, you know, any kind of argument around justice, because if you disassociate you know, worth with a community, how can you ever kind of have a view of trying to give an opportunity for that community to ever be close to equal to you, uh, let alone surpass you in certain ways? Um, and you know, if justice is anything but a fair shot at trying to you know, be your, your best self, um, you, have to, you have to see value in them the same way you might see it in yourself. And so, you know, we try to do that uh, on a day-to-day -day basis uh, throughout the projects that we do, and we'll, we'll talk about those later, but um, yeah, that's essentially what we focus on. Great, thanks, Omar, and Reverend Mariama. Good morning. So, um, you know, when I think about the work that I do, and it's this is not a rejection of any other term, I do environmental justice work, and I do climate justice work, and I, um, move in lots of different energy justice and all of those, but I think the term that I use most for the way I frame my work is ecological justice. And um, I do that because eco means home and um, ecology as a discipline looks at um, organisms in relationship with each other. Ecology, unlike you know biology, which is also important, which is often breaking things down to their smallest parts and understanding them, and that's important. But um, ecology says that you cannot understand any organism unless you understand um, the other organisms with which it shares space. And it looks deeply at the relationships. And from my perspective, um, People often say, oh, she does immigration work. She does, oh, you're just moving so many sectors. But, but for me, they're all the same because there's a problem in our relationships. Um, there's a problem in the way we treat each other and view each other. And any species that can't even manage to get it together to be in right relationship with the other species with which it shares 99% of its DNA probably can't ever be in right relationship also with the tiny bits of phytoplankton in the ocean that we can't see, but we rely on them because can't none of us create our own oxygen? Last time I checked, I am unable to create water. These are the things I need to live. From my perspective, the creator put us in the relationships that we were supposed to have so that we would care not just for one another as humans, but for trees that make it possible for us to breathe. We don't even think about it. 
We just expect that the air will have 21% oxygen on any given day. But that is because we have taken for granted those species with whom we are truly in life-giving relationships. And so it is not surprising that if you can't recognize that relationship on the things you need to live, it's not surprising that a people who think polluting water when the very makeup of our body is what, if you, any society that thinks that that is okay, it is not surprising that they would find so many harmful and foolish ways to not be in right relationship with each other. So for me, the climate crisis is not about parts per million. We can talk about that. I move on all sorts of policies and I could talk about what I think about public utilities and the intersection of energy and economic justice. But at the end of the day, I don't know if we deserve to survive the way we act. And so it's not about saving the planet because she gonna be okay. At some point though, she might say, in this family, <laughs> there's one dysfunctional being and maybe it'd be better for everybody else if that member of the family sat down. And so I think I push back on any attempts to create climate policy that does not ask who we want to be as a human species, what we owe to each other and what we owe to all the other beings on this planet, whether they are living or what we call inanimate, they are beings with whom we are in relationship. And if we don't wanna get that relationship right, then I don't think we deserve to survive. Um, and so I, I, even as we look at those technical solutions and they are absolutely necessary, we have to do them in such a way that as a human species, we shift and become worthy of remaining on this planet. Thank you, Reverend Mariama. That, that's a great perspective. Um, and I think, you know, with this framing of how do we invest in the climate justice that we're looking for, and, and I, I really love the term that you're using with eco, ecological justice. Um, how do we, you know, how is it happening on the ground in different places? We're all located or working in, in different geographies, um, although we have some overlap among, among where we call home. Um, so I, I think I'd like to go around and hear a little bit um, more about some of the specific projects and things you're working on and how it fits into this. Um, maybe we'll start with Omar and you can tell us a little more about um, what you're doing at SunWealth and what, what you're working on on the ground and then we can uh, yeah, hear sure. more rest. Thank you. So, I mean, some of the, the most exciting things we're working on now um, deal a lot with uh, low income community solar um, in, in Boston area as well as in New York. Uh, so in, in Boston, we're dealing with a, a couple of housing associations, a heading home and Caritas communities, which focus on um, training and housing of, of low income individuals. And so we're providing them with solar power to provide savings on their bills. Obviously, the, the less you have, the more meaningful your, your bill is, your electric bill is as part of your expenses and the more meaningful savings would be. Um, in New York, we've had the opportunity to um, be a part of the, the NYCHA program that's adding solar to several housing projects there. Um, you know, all of the ones that have been mentioned so far are projects that we own. So we have projects in uh, Queensbridge and Queens. We have projects in Brooklyn as well as in Manhattan. Uh, and you know, that's kind of a, a, a great kind of example of a, an additive approach. So not only are we providing savings to uh, hundreds of low-income uh, customers in the NYCHA community, but we're also providing payments to NYCHA as a lease payment. So helping to improve their balance sheet, as well as as a jobs training component um, on all of these sites where, you know, community members in these housing projects have the opportunity to learn how to construct uh, solar projects and hopefully have skills that'll allow them to, to enter this economy that you know, in a lot of areas, especially in the Northeast, uh, for various reasons, they're, they're locked out of. And so you know, this is kind of a situation where we're able to touch uh, several points that we focus on, you know, job creation, savings for customers, in addition to the, the environmental mitigation and 
to bring it all to bear to have a, a, a viable, you know, a financeable project uh, that's, you know, viable for investors. And so we, we hope to kind of recreate situations like that where we can um, going forward. In addition, we also try to enter into geographies that, you know, you would think they traditionally might be uh, less amenable to, to renewable energy. So we're doing some stuff in the Midwest and uh, working on a project in Appalachia as well, where you know we're trying to kind of open that up and provide the benefits as there, there as well, where they'll, they'll see you know jobs are being created, they'll see like money going to the communities. It'll hopefully open those those areas up for further investment. And and just a quick follow up, Omar, could you explain to our audience you know, how investors kind of invest in the the projects that you're doing on the ground and, and see the benefits? So, so there are two ways to invest um, using in the way uh, in all, most solar projects, but there's a debt component and then there's a, a tax equity component. Tax equity is a you know, more difficult investment to make because you need to have, unless you're a C corporation, you need to have a certain uh, kind of income with passive income uh, in addition to being an accredited investor. But you know, if you have that, then it's, it's a great opportunity to really catalyze growth and have a, a great return. On the debt side, um, there are a lot of different ways to go about it. There's traditional project finance through banks. The way we tend to focus on is through um, no pools where we reach out to impact investors uh, as well as other investors. And it's, a, it's just like any other note. So you buy uh, in, you provide, let's say you give uh, you know, $100,000, you get you know, 4% interest only for a period of six years. You can roll that at, at the end of six years or you can get your, your principal back. And so those are the ways that we're able to use capital to kind of build these projects and you know, provide you know, prices that allow for job creation, job training, and, and savings. So we're, we've been proud of that so far. Great, thank you. Um, and I, I believe you, um, well, Sunwealth, you and uh, some of your colleagues introduced us to Reverend Mariama. Uh, so we'll move to you. I don't know if the connection um, is through a project that you worked on, but feel free to talk about whatever projects that you, you're excited about that you're working on the ground. Yeah, so I, I have been an advisor to SunWealth. Um, and so um, uh, my relationship with SunWealth be began when um, the previous church I was at before we started New Roots, um, we wanted to do a solar project, we needed um, financing. And so we were one of the earlier SunWealth projects in which we sort of started thinking about how do we get investors to understand um, nonprofits because they don't have the same balance sheets as other things. And so we ended up doing a lot of, you know, sort of working together to figure out how do we um, make more of these projects possible. Um, but I'll take a, a moment to talk a little bit about another side of, of the work that I do. Um, after that project that we did engage around solar legislation, um, but I won't go too deep into that because that's something I also deal with in my office and I'm a little bit of in a moment of tension with the state around some of the those issues, so we'll leave those alone for right now. Um, uh, a lot, another piece that I've been working on a lot is around food justice, and um, really asking what would it take for us to have a vibrant um, local food movement? Um, because in the New England states, so you know, there's three sort of the three southern states in New England: um, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Connecticut are where they're sort of high population centers. And the three northern states in New England, Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont, are where there is far more open land. Much of that was once used for agriculture, um, but as more and more investment moved um, to centralize in the Midwest um, for a lot of, uh, you know, our, our staple foods in, in California, um, much of uh, sort of animal farming moved um, to the south, particularly I know North Carolina has dealt a lot with um, challenges around um, uh, hog farming, also some poultry, the, the, the consolidation of agriculture had decimated a lot of our um, local agricultural work. And that means that much of our 90% of the food from our state comes from out of state. And there are all the emissions associated with um, the kind of uh, uh, the transportation the kind of heavy use of nitrogen and chemicals um, that's causing major issues in terms of runoff and blooms in, in a lot, many parts of the Midwest. Um, and then there's just also the reality that when the rubber meets the road, if your food is coming from far away and you hit a shock um, 
if the electricity system goes down, if the roads have any problems, if there's a COVID outbreak at the meat processing plant, you are not secure as a region. Um, and so I've been um, really looking at how can we not just boost production, but the question is, um, how can we also build a local food movement that um, centers eaters? And I wanna say, I don't say consumers, because right now our local food movement, if you're a consumer, you need to be ready to pay $2 for a head of garlic. Now I'm willing to do that. I do do that. I'm in a place in my life now that I can do that. I was not always in a place in my life when I could do that. I remember when my paycheck could finish and there were $35 left in the bank when the bills were, were needing to be paid. If you have $35 left, you are not spending $2 on a head of garlic. You cannot buy $16.99 up for a pound of meat. And so we've been really looking at here, how do we equip, um, first of all, farmers of color locally. Um, as I mentioned, the three northernmost states have the most land. They are also the three whitest states in America. That's a bit of a challenge. Um, uh, but there are conversations that are happening. Indigenous folks who have had a history of growing their own food and that has been a challenge as they've lost land, as there have been policies that intentionally sought to displace um, folks' ability to earn a living. Um, and particularly a number of our immigrant um, brothers and sisters who come here with knowledge are here often because climate change has displaced them from the place that their family grew for generations. They're coming here having to work in service jobs, but they have real knowledge around farming that could be used um, locally if they could get access to land. And so this whole question around who owns the land, um, even in cases where people are claiming to be stewards of the land, land that was stolen from people who were much better stewards than they. <laughs> um, and so all of these conversations around how we get access to land, how we make sure people have the ability to farm for themselves, even a conversation we're starting on at the city, there's, there is anybody who tried to get seeds last year. I mean, there was a blowout on seeds. Um, you could have sold seeds on the corner in some parts of our community, like people were that in search, right? Uh, people were emailing, creating these like lists so that we could share. I'm like going to places, picking up seeds from other people. And that was because there was a boom in people who wanted to garden. My question is, are we making sure that at the front of the line of who gets access to the land are people for whom it's not just fun, right? Not just an extra plus to be gardening and to be able to say like, these collards are from my garden, but people for whom that's gonna make the difference about whether they're gonna eat or not. And how do we make sure that all of the work we're doing around local food is including centering and bringing resources first and foremost to people who are actually food insecure and not just being a hobby for those of us who realized how much mental health benefit it is um, and so I do, I have a work with um, a crew of my friends. There's 10 of us that run a cooperative, a black owned cooperative farm in Loudoun, New Hampshire. We are the only black people we know in Loudoun, New Hampshire. Um, and we can hear the NASCAR track on the weekends when it has uh, races. Um, but again, this question of um, how do we begin to have real conversations about land, um, about self-sufficiency, um, about the healthiness of our food, um, and, and all of how that comes together. And again, these are, again, these conversations about being in right relationship. I make sure every child in my life goes strawberry picking with me and helps me make jam because the supermarket is a soulless place and they need to see that there's so much power in the land um, and in really knowing where your food comes from. Um, and I, I want us to think about how we move money away from the consolidation of large tracts of land into land as a place where people can find home because we also got a housing crisis as well as feed themselves and rebuild our local food economy into one that is healthier, not using all these chemicals, um, not being trucked and flown all over the world uh, and really becomes a way that we build community. Uh, it is that uh, most basic system. And if the relationships aren't right in our most basic systems, how do we imagine we will 
have right relationships in our far more complex and maybe not quite as necessary systems. Thank you, Reverend Mariama. And um, the, the area of working on food resilience, food justice, um, and farming and forestry is really close to our heart too. We, we do a lot of work in this space um, on investing in regenerative agriculture and as well as working with low resource communities, communities of color, indigenous communities. So um, I'm really excited to hear maybe more at another time about that. Um, and I think it really dovetails well into some of the work that um, William is doing with, through the Rural Beacon Initiative. So we'll turn to you if you wanna talk more uh, about some of the same, same things. Yeah, thanks so much, Christy. You know, a lot of the work that we're trying to focus on right now is seeking to kind of convene uh, conversations. You know, a lot of what we're doing in the state is knowing that there's an educational component, right, where in order to open up the creativity for solutions, we have to fully understand the intersections of the problem. So when we talk about that exercise and doing the overlay, you know, there are times where we have gone into spaces, um, you know, policy tables, you know, people who are experts, who, but who have just never really sat down and seen the intersections of that work represented in that visual of a way. So what we try to hammer home is that, yes, we're talking about climate solutions, but in terms of, you know, what this opportunity represents, how do we think about the legacy of poverty in this country that we have, you know, manifested and created? How do we think about the legacies of, of redlining? How do we think about the legacies of exclusion, the legacies of environmental injustice that have forced communities to not be a part of the conversations when we talk about our now ecological crisis? And how do we understand that whatever we allow to happen to these communities on the front lines bodes what will eventually happen to us all? Um, so that's one way that we try to open up the conversations um, and just hammer that home in terms of the impact. In terms of policy, we then try to, you know, go through and really think through what creatively are co-benefits that are associated when we talk about climate solutions. So when we talk about, uh, you know, the, the, the work of expanding access to a clean energy economy or just transition, what does it mean to not just have communities be beneficiaries? passive beneficiaries of that transition, but active competitors, right? How do we think about inclusive supply chains and the new business models that are gonna be coming up? How do we think about the new economy that's gonna come as a result of this transition? And that being a massive opportunity for wealth generation, as many people have said on this call, that we probably won't get another opportunity in our lifetimes. You know, what does that look like? Um, so we raise these questions, right? Not saying that we have all the answers, but trying to get enough people in the space, enough experts in the space, thinking at that direction and saying, we really have license to think in an expansive, creative way, more so than we have before with this issue, right? And recognizing that when we talk about the capacity that's necessary to address this crisis, no one sector can do it alone, right? Nonprofit can't do it alone. Private finance can't do it alone. You know, public interest can't do it alone. Government can't do it alone. So how do we convene conversations in a way that we all recognize we have a piece, right, to bring to the table and say, how do we align this? You know, I'm also in the work that we're doing. We're very much um, intrigued by nature-based solutions, right, which I think sometimes don't get as much visibility. You know, there was a 2019 report by the Nature Conservation Conservancy that said uh, nature-based solutions could provide up to 37% of the emission reductions uh, needed by 2030 to keep global temperatures increase under two degrees Celsius, right? So thinking about that and how that represents huge opportunities for North Carolina's uh, uh, natural and working lands, but also how that represents huge opportunities to expand green space, right, to communities of color which has traditionally been an issue. And we know that there are huge societal and health co-benefits from just having that access. Like we're talking about an ecological crisis. Like right now, communities of color are very far behind in just having access to that land, you know, that Reverend Mariano was talking about, to, to accessing it, to going to these spaces, you know, but there are opportunities to use nature-based solutions to address some of the most egregious disparate impacts, whether you're talking about uh, uh, heat waves, you know, whether you're talking about uh, mitigation of, of sea level rise, um, so again, how do we convene these conversations to fully understand the scope of the issue and then give ourselves license to think uh, broadly about what the, 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 the opportunities for solutions are? That's great, thank you. Um, Banda, would you like to 
tell us, I know you've been doing work, like you mentioned, with the, the PRI, Principles of Responsible Investment, um, but I, I understand you also have some place-based work that you, you're been working on. So I'd love to hear about that as well. Sure. Um, but first, I wanted to thank Reverend Mariama for reminding us that it's strawberry season. <laughs> I had one of my first jobs, I don't know, maybe I was 12, was picking strawberries um, in Michigan. And I don't remember what we got, but maybe 10 cents a quart. And I had no idea how good I had it until I, you know, continually have to buy store-bought strawberries that have no taste. Oh, my gosh. This strawberry my, jam. This is my jam from last year. Oh. For our Haitian Appreciation Week. So it has Joyeux Jeudi. But I'll, I'll, new one's coming at the end later All right. next month. <laughs> We're going to compare notes later. Um, but I also really appreciate what you said about right relations. I, As Christy mentioned, um, I'm on the investment committee for the UA Common Endowment Fund, which is a, we're faith-based investors. And we talk a lot about right relations in our community, in our church and, and congregational communities. Um, but I never thought about it before in, you know, in my sort of role working with investors. So now I'm thinking, what would it look like for investors to be in right relationship with the communities um, that are impacted by their investments, with the workers, for companies to be in right relations? So I just, I really like that um, that phrase. It's very provocative and it's going to give me something to think about um, and hope that I can bring it into the work um, that we're doing in Colorado. So um, in Colorado, there's, I think, the country's only office of the just transition in the governor's office. And we're um, supporting them as they implement their plan for um, a just transition for Colorado's coal communities and workers. So in Colorado, they're set to close eight coal-fired plants and six coal mines by 2030. And you know, it's part of the state's history. They've always mined and burned coal since they became a state, but now the market has changed, the environment can't handle this. And um, you know, and it's it's had a devastating impact on communities. And, the transition, well, there has to be a transition. Um, and so to address that, they've put in place some pretty, uh, I think, um, aggressive and progressive legislation in Colorado. So just to sort of capture the impact, um, this is jobs, careers, property taxes, and economic vitality, and also um, community identity. Um, and I think that for me, what has been sort of one of the biggest um, learnings that I've had in working with folks is just the impact on the tax base. So just to give you an example, in um, Moffat City, which is in Route County, Colorado, they're gonna lose 45% of property taxes. So statewide, 3.2 billion in commercial property value will be lost because of these closures. And so that's gonna impact fire, schools, water, library, you know, health, sanitation, colleges, everything. And so the impact, um, it's very, very widespread. And that's in addition to job losses where you've got coal jobs, which are, you know, um, well-paying with benefits, and a lot of jobs in the renewable sector are low-wage jobs um, with no protections um, and benefits. So, um, how do we address all these all these issues as investors? So, I just want to sort of list out a couple things that investors can do um, for those who are investors on the call with us today. Um, so, um, we have and we can engage companies around labor standards. Um, we can and we have. Um, um, make made investments um, in areas um, that have been hard hit by a transition with kind of an impact lens and um, taking in some of the, especially for mission investors, um, the values that we hold. And then we can also do things like demand responsible contractor policies and high labor standards so that the transition from these, you know, coal and, and um, high um, paying energy jobs um, into the renewable sector doesn't have to be going from a good job to a really bad job. Um, and then I think we can also do a lot of work on the policy front. So we have new opportunities um, with the Biden-Harris administration um, at a, a federal level, but also at a state level. We've um, been working with a group of investors in Massachusetts to engage on state policy as well. So I think that investors don't really recognize the clout they have, and they also um, need to, to think about what their role is. Um, and that comes back to the right relations perspective. You know, how do we not lead? How do we follow? Um, how do we put the needs of communities and workers at the forefront of the decisions that we're making? Thank you, Vanda. That, that's um, a good segue. I was going to go, turn now and, and ask people about concrete steps for, for the folks in the room. The audience includes investors and activists, um, people working at this 
nexus. Um, where should we focus our efforts to invest in climate justice? What themes, what asset classes, what models can scale beyond some of these local examples? And, and Vonda, you, you've already alluded to, to a lot of those. Um, if you'd like to go first and can, if you have anything else to add to that or. Um, sure, yeah, I can, I'll just say really quickly, um, three things that investors can do. Um, so one is you could join our work in Colorado. So we have a meeting coming up at the end of June for impact investors and grant makers. Um, so I'm sure that there's a way to reach me. I can put my email in the chat. Um, there's a lot of ne networks that are working on the just transition. So just to name a couple, the Interface Center and Corporate Responsibility um, is doing a lot of great work around engagement um, and also um, trying to develop a set of um, you know, really strong practices for stakeholder engagement, not just sort of a check the box, oh, we need to talk to workers of the community, but really how do we do that deep engagement and, and hold companies accountable to that? Um, and then I already talked about the policy level. So I think join, join forces with investors and activists to promote um, the strong policies that we need at a, a city, state, and federal level. So those are three things just to, to get folks started. Great, thank you. Um, let's turn to William. Yeah, I think one thing that we've been doing is trying to get a resurgence of the 17 principles of EJ, right? So when people have asked the questions of like, how do we operationalize these concepts, right, of equity, of justice, one thing we've inserted is that as a major resource, kind of a back to basics. Uh, I think another piece that we've been thinking of through is um, what would it look like to look at some of the most egregious models of environmental injustice across the nation. You know, we've been working with groups in Cancer Alley through Poor People's Campaign, uh, groups who have uh, in North Carolina, groups who have really been fighting uh, for generations, these extractive industries. So what would it look like to talk about them, not only as models for this local engagement, but to look, them, look at them as proof of concept models, where we say, if we provide support and expertise and resources, not just to stop these polluting projects, but to take them the full gambit from an extractive economy to a beacon of what it looks like to be a full-fledged participant in the new clean energy economy, how does that change the you know change the conversation, right? How do we have an example that we can then point to and say this is where uh, solutions are being done and being done well? Where we're talking about community investment, talking about access to green space, talking about um, you know uh, uh, operationalizing uh, uh, equity and justice and, and and community ownership, right? So. Um, those are questions that I, I would ask people to think through and think through very critically. Yeah. Uh, Reverend Mariama. Yeah, so I um, have worked a little bit in this space and I have uh, my two pennies beginning to invest. Um, and so a couple of things I would say, um, they're not major, but um, I, I think in, in, in concurrence with Vonda is one of the things is that to just ask questions. I think when um, folks know that the question is gonna get asked and you're gonna expect a, a due diligence answer like you expect on the financial side, um, it, it pushes folks to get serious about, you know, when you ask about the labor practices and you're expecting them to have a, a strong answer the same way you do about your returns, it, it pushes people to think differently. If many of us begin asking those questions, it makes a difference. I think the other piece I would say is that I really think we need to think a lot about this question of risk, along with this idea of right relationship. Um, so uh, we are, my church are investors in the Ujima project. And um, one of the things I really love about Ujima is um, that it says that folks who have more money are inherently taking less risk when they put their money in. And so people who only have enough money to, to invest $50 in Ujima actually get a higher return than people who have the money to, ingest, object, to invest 50,000. Because let's be honest, if you have 50,000 to put in, if you lose that, you're not gonna miss a meal. But people who have to scrape together to put $50 in, often, those are folks who don't have the resources. So the question of what risk are you truly taking, being honest about that, and, and then, asking sort of um, what is the other reward that I'm getting that may not show up as financial. And the reality is that high financially, you know, I, I, I don't like high net worth because for me, worth actually means something and attaching money and worth, I have a real problem with. So people who have a lot of money 
have benefited the most from and often participated most in the damage that we have experienced in our world. And so there is a higher responsibility as my grandmother always used to say, and my father quite also took up, um, to whom much is given, much is required. And so I think really asking hard questions about when I evaluate this, what are the rewards that may not show up in my bank account, but are absolutely necessary to the survival of even my grandchildren, for instance, um, that are coming out of that? And am I willing to forego financial um, gain for rewards that are absolutely necessary for the human species to survive. And so to really reframing our thinking, and that's, I'm not saying just invest in things that you think are gonna you know, lose your money. I do, um, do we, we've set aside, I mean, we only have 5,000, so it's like not that much money, but we're hoping to grow it in places where we can put money in to things right in our community. And we do ask hard questions and we also say, God has blessed us that we even have $5,000, but we, if we lose it, we're not gonna miss a meal. So we're gonna think about it wisely, but we wanna make sure that um, if we have any extra resources, they're going in places that bring the rewards we're already fighting for in our community. I think for those of, of folks who are in the philanthropic side, and I'm sure you're already trying to make this argument, but, um, why are we giving grants to solve problems and sometimes then unwilling to put our uh, endowment in investments that are solving the same problems? It, it, it just begs to the question, are we serious about really addressing the challenges that we're facing? And so I think there's just a lot of ways of sh shifting our thinking, that, that shift in the way we approach it often leads to different conclusions about what we're able to do, what kind of risk we should take, how courageous we are. Um, because when you're investing in things that make the difference about whether or not people can feed their families, communities that have been ravaged by the exit of the fossil fuels, or communities that you're asking to walk away from fossil fuels and the only other job is at McDonald's. I mean, would you take that deal? So you've got to offer people a better deal if you want them to walk away from factory farming, even if they know it hurts them. If there's not another option, then we're not serious about asking people to join us in this climate movement. So I think there's a lot of ways that if we shift our frame, we can partner with people differently, we can think about risk differently, we can think about reward differently, and we can partner to together differently, recognizing that we are all um, trying to fight for the right of the human race to survive. Um, and that we bring different kinds of expertise and different, and I do wanna point back, push back. There are no low resource communities. There are some communities where their resources are being extracted. And a lot of times they're being extracted by the same folks who come back later. And I think we gotta come back with a humility about our participation in that extraction and, and show up saying, yes, I have some resources. I'm trying to be part of together making things right. Thank you, Reverend Mariama. And also um, you've kind of given some insight into one of the questions that's come into the chat about what role the philanthropic sector can play in supporting the climate justice finance ecosystem. So it was well, <laughs> well placed um, to bring that up. I am gonna turn to Omar um, and then we're gonna try to get a couple of these other questions in. Um, but this has been such a good conversation. So Omar, what, what are some of the, you know, ways to scale what, what you've been doing or other um, examples that you'd like to talk about? Yeah, a lot of it'll be, you know, complimentary to what Reverend Mariama was saying. Um, you know, I, I think from, from an investor standpoint, you have to, you know, change the lens in which you, you look at things and, and how and where you put your money, um, you know, and kind of step back from a lot of the metrics and proxies that you use because they're easy. Uh, because, you know, a lot of these things help to perpetuate the same inequalities that have occurred before. And if you're gonna do the same thing you've always done, how are you gonna expect a, a different result? And so for example, something like credit scores where um, you know, you, you have a, a lot of low-income communities, obviously, with, with lower credit scores. 
doesn't necessarily mean that they're not going to pay their electric bill. So you don't look at necessarily the what, you look at the why. Like why are the credit scores low? And is there something, a way you can structure an investment to where you know, you're mitigating that? So you provide a uh, low income uh, customer with savings on their bill, you're automatically, instead of charging them kind of an exorbitant rate because their credit's low and they're subprime, then you're relieving kind of pressure, economic pressure on them. And the less pressure they have, the more likely they are to service their bill and the more likely that investment is to be a good investment. So just really being thoughtful and creative around how you know you put your money to work and, and the, the vehicles that you put your money to work are, um, are is, is vital to in order to, to get this to scale and actually you know be a, a, a true market. And that doesn't just go for you know it, it's it's most you know it's clear when it's with private investors, but it goes for I mean like Mariana mentioned with with philanthropies as well. Whereas they're still using, a lot of them would still use the same, you know, kind of proxies and metrics, you know, maybe they'll give a grant for something, but, you know, putting like their money to work in a way that will really catalyze significant change. And they're using the same proxies from their wealth advisors that everyone else does. And you're, you're keeping capital from areas, again, you're not valuing a segment of the community where there is value. And so, you know, it's good, I mean, for us, you know, we're, we're kind of first movers in a lot of this space and trying to prove that value and there'll be some benefit to that. But, you know, if we're the only movers there, we would consider ourselves, we wouldn't consider ourselves as being successful. Um, you know, we're trying to drive, you know, create kind of a market and demonstrate the viability of it. And if we get people in that aren't mission aligned, but kind of do the, the base of the work of the mission because they want to make money, then that's, that's significant. That's scale. Right? It's not necessarily going to be able to change hearts and minds at a pace that you need to. It's going to be able to you know, get the, the results that you're looking for um, you know, at, at, a, at a pace that you know, it needs to happen. Uh, the other thing for, um, on the other end, you know, I would say you know, for the kind of people on the ground and activists, the one thing to make sure to do is to you know, encourage participation. Uh, you know, we've mentioned kind of the jobs trainings programs and things like that, but I mean, in certain areas, um, and you know, unions are a great thing, but you know, they can block out, you know, segments of the community, um, you know, because during you know a certain period, you know, there there were policies just like redlining where I mean it was inherently racist, and now you have a a kind of monochromatic base, and they want to have their friends and family, which are fine, and kind of bring them in to enjoy the same benefits but they seem that they'll be the same kind of from the same community as the original people. And so there has to be a, a, an opportunity to kind of share that, that benefit. So whether it's partnering with, with groups and communities where you're making the investment to allow them to kind of enjoy the, the benefits of, of the labor and um, getting that, getting real wages for that or some other solution, I, I don't know, but you know, there has to be you know, a, a push there as well to make sure that, you know, again, you know, to, to steal a Mariama's uh, point, as far as you know, keeping things from being extractive. You know, you don't want it to be kind of over cultivation where you're just kind of going in and you're farming everything you can and then there's nothing left. You know, it's much better for you, for, for them, you know, for everyone if you're additive. You know, again, by you know, providing savings, providing economic benefits to you know, the communities that you're in, you, you allow yourself to reinvest in them and compound kind of the returns on your investment. And so you really can be a place where you have a real sustainable, not only a business model, but a sustainable community. So that's that's where I would leave it. Thank you, Omar. Um, there have been a, a few more questions, but I realize we are at the top of the hour. So I wanna respect everyone's time. Um, we have like one slide to just put up and, and say thank you um, to our speakers and our supporters. Um, it's been really great to have you all together. I hope I hope we can get together and continue the conversation. Um, and uh, Nick, thank you. Yes, yeah, so I, I promise I'd give you information if you're interested in having your firm sponsor or partner with our um, Croatian conversation series uh, on a whole the whole series or a specific conversation that you'd like to see us foster. Please let us know. You can also donate as an individual um, or support us by providing feedback on the topic and more. Um, you can complete the form that's going to pop up. If you're on the Zoom, it'll pop up at the end of this conversation, or you can just email us at conversations at croatininstitute.org. And um, 
you can also continue the conversation. Please follow us and, and join the conversation. Let us know what you're thinking about this, these topics. And a lot of this group here is tagged as well um, on some of our posts. So feel free to pull them in as well. And I think, is there another slide or else um, just say thank you very much. And I hope you enjoy your afternoon. I wish we could stay on longer, but um, it's, you've all given us a great perspective on how to invest in climate justice going forward and, and hope we can keep keep the momentum going. Thank you. Thank you.